Coming up on Green Bay Nation, the Packers lose in a similar fashion once again and say goodbye to a noted leader before trying to earn their first win in over a month. All that and more next on Green Bay Nation. Hello and welcome to Green Bay Nation. I'm Lauren Helbrecht and joining me to chat everything Packers, he's a Packers beat writer for the Green Bay Press Gazette, Ryan Wood, and he's a radio host for 107.5 and 1400, the fan, Marcus Eversall. I know we're a day late. Happy Halloween. I would say that the Packers are doing more tricking than treating right now. Yeah, there's nothing good right now about the Packers product on the field. So there's that. The good thing is none of us are getting traded. We're not going to Buffalo. We're here for the season. Or so, so you think. The deadline's over. The deadline's over. Okay. That's all I know. You've been told that? We will be Officially. talking about a very key trade coming up in the show. But first, let's talk about the game. Packers lose a fourth straight. This one to Minnesota, 24-10. to 10. After the game, this is what Matt LaFleur said as quotes. That game was, quote, tough to watch. And he said, quote, we are a mess right now. What is going on at 1265 Lombardi? I mean, I said right after that game, after LaFleur's post-game press conference, that you got to give LaFleur credit for at least one thing. He nailed that post-game presser. His opening statement was the perfect summary of what happened in that game. He's like, that was, that was tough to watch. Anyone else who watched that can confirm that indeed it was tough to watch. Too many drops, too many penalties. I mean, what's going on at 1265 right now is not a whole lot of progress. I mean, you expected growing pains. It's a young team. I know we're only seven games into it, but we're also seven games into it, and we just have seen so few glimpses of, of progress so far, and that's concerning. Yeah, I, I don't think it's so much tricking, though, to go back to your, your early, because this is, I go back to what Brian Gudekin said at the beginning, uh, uh, during the offseason more than once. Aaron Rodgers had a losing record as the Packers quarterback midway through his second season. This is a process, he said today, and that's what's going to want to play out over long term, not short fixes. And some clerical work. 163 first half minutes since the Packers last scored a first half touchdown. The Packers actually on defense had an intended receiver in the first quarter Sunday, Clay Walker. Kirk Cousins' pass went right to him, dropped, dropped the pass, dropped the interception. These are the things that just can't happen if you're trying to stem the tide. Instead, they're spiraling right now. And what, what happened is they, they've emphatically stamped that this is a rebuild and this is going to be a process. And one way that they have stamped that this is going to be a rebuild is by trading away one of the key leaders in the locker room. Obviously, biggest news yesterday, Rasul Douglas was traded to the Buffalo Bills with a fifth-round pick for a third-round pick. Earlier today, Keyshawn Nixon just looked and felt shocked about the trade. They're good friends. Their lockers were right next to each other. That was kind of the sentiment around the locker room, too. It was guys were just surprised. Why does this trade make sense for the Packers right now? It makes sense for the Packers in that, like we've talked about so often, this season is more about laying the foundation for future seasons. And that's hard to accept during the season when you're playing games and you're losing four in a row like the Packers are right now. But if you take a step back and you just look at it, if this season is about laying the, the foundation for 2024, 2025 and beyond, this next era of Packer football, then realistically, is a third round pick worth more than Rasul Douglas for the remainder of this season? Probably. I mean, I can understand why the Packers did it. On the other hand, I can see why the players aren't nuts about it, why there's going to be an effect on the locker room and even some fans. You don't have to like the trade because he's more than just a good player. He's a key figure in that locker room on a really young team. So there are pros and cons to it, but I mean, from a big picture perspective, Brian Gudekinst is concerned about more than just this season. In fact, he's more concerned with the future, and that's why they did the deal. Is a third-round pick worth more than Rasul Douglas? Well, I guess it depends on that third-round pick, right? Because the track record <laughs> that this team has in the third round for a decade now, it's, it's worse than the Packers' offense at the moment, and that's saying something. Look, it's as Brian Gudekinst said, it's a four-year rookie contract that they're getting. You're expected to get starters in the third round. The Packers at some point have to fall over backwards and get a starter in the third round, you would think. It's a team that's been in cap hell that is at near the finish line of that. They can see the finish line, and they're wiping $7 million off of next year's cap. That's significant. 
What it really is is it's a, it's a team that needs that's not a Rasul Douglas away from contention. So if you can rebuild for the future, that's I was on the show with Marcus and, uh, yesterday when this trade went down. The first thing that I said was that's what a rebuild looks like. This is what a rebuild looks like. You you package assets now for the future. Now on the other end of the it's a business NFL. Rashawn Gary signed a four-year, $107 million extension before the Vikings game Sunday morning. Gary has 15 pressures and four and a half stacks so far this season. So, as much as Rasul makes sense to trade away, why do you think this extension makes sense right now? It makes sense right now because Rashawn Gary is their best football player, arguably. Definitely their best defensive player so far this season. I mean, the only question really about Rashawn Gary's extension is what took so long. I suppose you could say he's coming off the torn ACL. They wanted to see him do it for an extended period of time before they paid him. But Rashawn Gary is one of those guys. Ever since they drafted him 12th overall back in 2019, He's done everything you've asked him to do. He's been everything you hoped that he would be when you when you took him early in the draft. If you don't pay Rashawn Gary the going rate, then who do you pay? He's done everything he's asked. Rashawn Gary is also three years younger than Russell Douglas, and that's where this team is. They don't just want good, especially on that defense. They they want young and good. They want a group, a core group that they can build and grow with for the future. That means youth. Rashawn Gary doesn't turn 26 until December. That's a big part of it, too. He's got a lot of good football ahead of him. I love talking about how young the players are, don't you? Yeah, yeah the Packers. feel very old. The Packers love it, too. But youth's not an excuse. It's not an excuse. We still don't know what the excuse is, and then. With age but... comes with all the expressions. All right, when we come back, we'll keep more of those expressions going. The Packers are prepping for another home game and another opportunity to get a win. This time hosting the Los Angeles Rams. How does Matt LaFleur's team stack up? That's next. Welcome back to Green Bay Nation. Lauren Helmbrecht alongside Ryan Wood and Marcus Eversall. So when the Packers traded away Rasul yesterday, fans kind of took that as an indication that Green Bay might be tanking. I saw some memes. I assume you probably did as well. Today, GM Brian Gutekus was asked about the trade, and he said the deal was just too good to turn down and that he doesn't believe any team in the NFL tanks. Jerry's still out on that one. All right, so between those two, and now that a key leader is gone, where do the Packers go from here, Ryan? Well, where they're heading is right now for their first top five pick since 2006, when they took A.J. Hawk fifth overall. If the draft was this weekend, they'd be picking sixth overall, and the softest portion of their schedule is already in the rear view. So if things are going to get better, they, they, they missed an opportunity against the Raiders, against the Broncos. Uh, but I think the question that if they do end up in that territory, the question that's going to ride over this entire rest of the season is do you use that premium draft stock to build around Jordan Love, or do you take a top quarterback? Do you take a Drake May? Do you take a Caleb Williams? That's going to be fascinating. Ryan Gudikin said today that he has faith in Jordan Love. He would not say that he's ready to name him the long-term starter, and he's hoping that that gets done in the next 10 games. There's a lot of football left in this season, but that's the question that's going to be riding over the, the, net, the, the final 10 games. As a USC alum, all I have to say is prepare to be sick of me if Caleb Williams gets drafted to the Packers. I'm just giving everyone a heads up. Drake May. You never say anything about USC. I can't imagine. Fight on. All right, back to the show. Marcus, now that Rasul is gone, as we, we've seen many times in the locker room, very vocal leader, he's always holding court. Who is going to assume that role, kind of the locker room guy, the, the leader in a vocal way, not just on the field? Well, it's interesting. The guy that comes to mind right away for me is Rashawn Gary, who's just a, a natural lead by example kind of guy. And he's he's not afraid to be vocal. You'll see him firing up guys and things like that. But it's kind of an interesting dynamic because let's just look at when the Packers last won the Super Bowl, let's say, okay? On that team, who was the leader? Charles Woodson. I mean, like that just by nature, he is by in his DNA, he was a leader. People, when he spoke, people listened. Before that, the last time they won a Super Bowl in 96, Reggie White, Leroy Butler, same kind of thing. I'm not comparing this defense to those defenses because we know how far away this team is from a Super Bowl. However, there's not, I don't think there's just a, a natural leader on this defense. Rasul Douglas was that guy. I think Rashawn Gary's got some of that in him too, but there's not any just blatantly obvious leaders right now. I asked Jair today if he was going to change his behavior at all, given that Rasul has left. He said, no, I'm still going to be me, which 
That's pretty much what you expect from Jair Alexander. So with all the craziness around the trade, can't forget that Sean McVay and the Rams are coming to town in just a couple of days. Matt Stafford is currently dealing with an injury. He's listed as questionable. So ahead of Sunday, how do you think the Rams team stacks up against the Packers? Well, real quick, I mean, Matthew Stafford, to me, that's the biggest factor in this game. They've got two really, really good receivers. Packers just traded Rasul Douglas. That's a tough matchup. They're very similar teams in that not a lot was expected of either of them coming in. Packers are the youngest team in the league. The Rams are the second youngest team in the league. Lafleur's had a lot of success against McVay over the years, but this one, it's a toss-up. We have no idea, obviously, if Matt Stafford's going to play or not. Let's say, just for hypotheticals, it's Brett Rippon. I think it'll be fascinating to see how a decidedly backup quarterback who is, has two elite weapons in Puka Nuchua and Cooper Cup, how, how much difference does that make on the quarterback position? Because right now you're seeing Jordan Love. So few of the issues on this offense actually have to do with Jordan Love. And one of the big issues is drop passes, wrong routes, the lack of a, pl a playmaker, a consistent go-to guy. Well, Brett Rippon's got two of those guys if he's starting for the Rams this week, and it'll be fascinating to see how much of a difference that actually makes. We'll have to see if the Packers can end this losing streak. They haven't won a game since September 24th. All that losing is adding up. When we come back on Green Bay Nation, it's time to head to the locker room and hear how the players' morale is amidst the, lo the losing streak, pardon me, and why they believe Green Bay still has what it takes to win. Welcome back to Green Bay Nation. Following the Packers loss on Sunday, Aaron Jones was tearing up in the locker room discussing how he feels like the offense has let the defense down so far this season. And today, the defensive secondary seemed a little shell-shocked after the news of Rasul Douglas's trade. Both sides of the ball still have a deep desire to win and to right this ship, though. So it's time to get in the zone. Cam is there. Losing four straight is a tough pill to swallow for anyone, but with so much of the season left, these Packers players know right now is not the time to hang it up. I tell people this all the time. I say, we got 10 games left and we're going to win out. You know, so that's how, I, that's how I feel. I know a few other people might feel the same way, but I'm going to be the first to say it. we're going to win out. Oh, my, my, my message to the whole team is just continue to work every day. Um, take it day by day. Um, Keep our confidence high. Don't get frustrated. Um, it's tough. You know, we're, we're not in a great spot that we want to be in right now. Um, no one expected it, but, you know, we're here now. So it's just come ready to work every day. Um, come ready to find 1%, how you can get 1% better every day. Um, just keep, keep going. I feel like the message is really just to stay together. I feel like everyone knows we have, like, the pieces in place um, and the players, the talent to do it. Uh, for whatever reason, it hasn't worked out the way we wanted uh, to this point, but it's within our control to turn it around, and um, I feel like everyone kind of knows that. I mean, the message really, honestly, is just we got to find a way to win, uh, find a way to get out of the slump, find a way to get some momentum going, um, you know, get some more energy out there, you know, start fast and, and just be able to play fast. Um, but, I mean, I, honestly, the, the number one thing is just to, we got we to find a way to, to win. You'd expect that level of optimism from players that just want to flip the season around some way, somehow. But guys, what do you think the overarching message should be going into this back half of the year? All right, now it's time for Q&A with Green Bay. So what's the message? How do the players stay motivated when it seems like things are going in the we're not thinking about 2023, we're thinking about 2024 direction? I mean, you got to look at it like a 10 game season. And I know you play to win the game, like Herm Edwards said so famously, you play to win every game. But in all reality, more important than the wins and losses right now is progress, evaluating this young talent. And let's face it, these guys are playing for jobs. There's a lot of high draft picks specifically on this offense. It's a really young offense, but a lot of high draft picks. That doesn't guarantee anything. The moment you're drafted, the moment you're signed, how you got here doesn't matter. Whoever performs the best is going to be here to stay. And right now, the Packers are in complete evaluation phase. The reality is that they've never needed the leaders in that locker room who are remaining after this trade to lead more than they do now because it's going to be up to them. There's, there's a few players in this locker room that have played winning football, and they're going to have to be the guiding light out of this losing rut, and, and it's important for the culture not to get used to this. I, I asked Jair Alexander today, how's things changed for you now that Rasul Douglas isn't in there, that, that room to – to share the, the leadership role. He said a lot more eyes on me and what I do and how I respond to things. He, he's aware of that. Kenny Clark told me straight up, 
It was a tough pill to swallow. At first he thought Rasul Douglas was joking, and, and that's very on board, on brand for Rasul Douglas. He has that dry wit. He wasn't joking. This, this is a tough pill to, to swallow for this defensive side especially. All right, when we come back, it's time for Challenge or No Challenge presented by the Good Guys Heating and Cooling. Going into week nine, will the guys agree with what I have to say or will the challenge flags be thrown and then we're making some green and bold predictions? All that and more is next. Welcome back to Green Bay Nation. Lauren Helmbrecht here alongside Ryan Wood and Marcus Eversall. It's time now for Challenge or No Challenge presented by the Good Guys Heating and Cooling. If you agree with what I say, nothing happens. If you dis disagree, you do your best Matt LaFleur impression. Those flags hit the floor. We have reached the part of the season where I'm talking about kickers. Challenge or No Challenge, Anders Carlson is perfect against the Rams. No challenge. I th Anders Carlson had a really rough training camp, and I thought it was going to be a really long year. That's been one of the bright spots so far this season. Carlson's been great. That's where they're at. Their best player is a rookie kicker. Uh, no challenge. And ditto, Marcus. He was not good in training camp. He's turned it around real quick. Ryan literally shuddered just now thinking I, about that. Flashbacks. <laughs> All right, speaking of shuddering, Packers scoring points. Move, scary. <laughs> but against the Rams, historically, they've been pretty good under Matt LaFleur, scoring at least 24. So challenge or no challenge, the Packers score at least 20 in this game. Oof, a big difference, obviously. The Packers have been really good when they've been scoring against the Rams. This year, eh, not so much. And yet, I'm not going to challenge it. I think they'll get to 20. 20. It's 20. Ryan, talk before I change my mind. That was hopeful. <laughs> they had Aaron Rodgers on those teams, right? Uh, he was an MVP quarterback. Yep. I, I almost remember that. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm challenging that. Until I actually see it, and then, until there's proof, 20 points is clearly a hurdle they can't clear. Yeah, touchdowns have been hard to come by in that first half. All right, when we come back, it's time to wrap up the show and get green and bold. Who we think will win in week nine? That's next. It's time to get green and bold here on Green Bay Nation as we wrap up the show. Marcus Ryan, who do you have winning in week nine? I'm going to take the Rams. A lot of the a lot of my confidence in this has to do with the status of Matthew Stafford. If he plays a Definitely confident the Rams win. If he doesn't play, I still think they have a chance because the Packers are not very good right now. This is where it's really hard to make predictions on Wednesday when the opposing quarterback, you don't know if he's going to play. I'm going to take the Rams because I think Matthew Savage is going to play. If he doesn't play, if it's Brett Rippon, I think I might take the Packers like 9-6. to six. A lot of field goals, a lot of rocks thrown. It'll be a rock fight. Ugh. But, yeah, I have no idea if the quarterback's going to play. I think that a Packers team without Rasul Douglas against a Rams team that has Puka Nakua and Cooper Cup, yeah, I'm, I'm leaning towards the Rams. I don't really think the quarterback changes that much because the Packers have just struggled so mightily on offense that if a team could pick apart their defense, it's game over in that way. Brett Rippins from Spokane, so that, he has that going for him. That is true. We were learning a lot about my background yeah. in today's show. Yeah. All right, yeah. that'll do it in this edition of Green Bay Nation. For Marcus Eversall and Ryan Wood, I am Lauren Helmbrick. The Packers take on the Los Angeles Rams at Lambeau this Sunday.